on Anglia. The madness, the assertiveness, the playfulness, the energy, the excitement, the exhaustion, the confusion, the agony, the ecstasy. In the world of comedy, Victoria Wood is not standing still. Or struggling unsuccessfully with trapped wind. Victoria Wood, Sunday at 9. And later this evening, the tale of a woman who believes that she's haunted by the ghost of her dead son in Chiller at 10.40. First day's not going very well. She'll kill me if I'm late with the coffee. A cup of really smooth might help. I don't know. I've heard she's a right old battle axe. You'll find her bark's much worse than her bite. Sorry I'm late. It was the... Kenko really smooth. Real coffee taste in an instant. If you're looking to buy your first home and need a great deal on a fixed-rate mortgage, Help and advice from a name you can trust, as well as a speedy decision. Everything points to the Halifax. In an accident like that, you would call the police. But they can't arrange your insurance, can they? That's the job of the AA. I was really surprised when they had the best deal for me. AA car insurance cost less than I thought. Make sure you give them a call on 0800 Hi, the new key season prices are in. It means low prices on the products that you want now, like gardening. Lawnmowers. This one comes with a powerful Honda engine. This new fly mow really packs in the grass. And don't forget the power breaker. Garden compost. Pansies, all at low prices. Paving slab, the catch your pressure washer. Gets them really clean. Fencing, timber care. If you can find them locally for less, <laughs> we'll refund double the difference, and that can't be bad. For your key season prices, you can do it when you've been cured. Buy a pair of glasses from Donald and Aitchison and get a pair of prescription sunglasses absolutely free. Perfect. Do you remember how we used to swap food when we were little? Yeah, like a couple of Jack Sprats. It used to drive Mum mad. You were so outgoing. I used to be much shyer, didn't I? Yes, but you've come out of your shell now, haven't you? <laughs> Do you remember you'd never smile in photos? Well, you were like a Cheshire cat. I used to have such funny boyfriends. Oh, thanks, Em. <laughs> come to think of it, your taste in blokes has never really improved. That's my husband you're talking about. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that with all the billions of people in the world, you never get two the same? Because there's only one you, Booper is dedicated to doing every little thing we can to give you the best possible care. You're amazing. We'll help you stay that way. What is it? Fast is loose. It's late lunch. It's ow. It's ow. It's late lunch. It's hey. It's yeah. Break that, break that. Robson Green. It's him. In a dramatic new series. There's no time. There's no time. Touching Evil. Coming soon. Coming up on Anglia News in half an hour, the Rosie Maternity Hospital suspends a midwife after she reveals she's HIV positive. And a woman is told she's so large she must buy two plane seats. Those stories and more coming up after the news at 10. Reject the Ulster peace deal. Iraqi leukemia girl flies into more controversy. Freezing ice warning tonight after spring snowstorms. And fighting dirty, rival vacuum cleaner makers square up. Good evening. A strong loyalist challenge to the Northern Ireland peace agreement was mounted today. The Grand Orange Lodge, standard bearer of Protestantism and Unionism, said it couldn't recommend the settlement to the people of Ulster as it stands. The order wants clarification of what it called vital points. 
And today, the Democratic Unionist leader Ian Paisley launched his campaign for a no vote in the referendum on the deal. He called it a sellout. Our island correspondent John Irvine reports. He may be 72, but Ian Paisley is still a formidable political force here. And now he has something new in his sights. He's out to wreck Friday's peace accord. If that agreement is to last, it must be endorsed by the people at next month's referendum. But today began with the DUP leader launching the Vote No campaign. And he had this message for the unionist community. A yes vote is a negative vote to dismantle the union. A no vote is a positive vote to safeguard the union. And it was clear from this news conference that Dr. Paisley has lost none of his combative verve. I'm in charge of this press conference. Shut your mouth. Right. This is a battle for our Protestant heritage. Dr. Paisley has been here before. In 1974, he mobilized hardline unionist opinion against another deal endorsed by moderates. The Sunningdale agreement was eventually wrecked. This evening, the Prime Minister appealed to people here not to let history repeat itself. Listen to those who want success in the future in Northern Ireland and not listen to those who simply want the whole arrangement to fail. But unionist concerns are all the more apparent tonight following the Orange Order's failure to endorse the settlement. The order is made up of tens of thousands of Protestants and their position creates a problem for the Ulster unionist leader, David Trimble. He has signed up to the agreement but is yet to get his party's backing. This weekend, members will give their verdict and as the biggest party, they have the power to swing the referendum result either way. David Trimble and Ian Paisley are trying to take the unionist community in opposite directions. And the referendum result may well depend on which one of them wins the hearts and minds battle. Northern Ireland's immediate future is at stake. John Irvine, News at 10, Belfast. The Labour MP George Galloway flew into London tonight with a little Iraqi girl he's brought here for treatment for her leukaemia. The child was taken to hospital immediately. Mr. Galloway denied being an apologist for the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. IDN's Colin Baker reports. Atrocious weather conditions at Heathrow and across Europe turned one little girl's flight for life into a 14-hour journey of delays. It was a dazed and somewhat startled four-year-old who was wheeled into the terminal in her grandmother's arms. Mariam Hamza was diagnosed with leukaemia in Iraq last July. Her chemotherapy treatment was constantly interrupted by shortages. She was rarely given the right combination of drugs which could save her life. Until Labour MP George Galloway discovered her in hospital in Baghdad, which he was visiting last month, Marion seemed condemned to die. Mr Galloway is opposed to sanctions against Iraq, but denies he's being used by Saddam for propaganda purposes. If 29 countries, armies, navies and air forces in a whole war in 1991, did not remove the Iraqi regime. How is punishing this little girl likely to remove the Iraqi regime? So she is a victim of the Iraqi regime, but she's a victim twice. She's a victim of the Iraqi regime, and she's a victim of our policy towards the Iraqi regime. Along with many other children, Mariam was in the Saddam Hospital in Baghdad. Her father, a 30-year-old farm labourer and conscript, carried her out this morning to begin the journey to London. She left behind hundreds of similar suffering youngsters. George Galloway says sanctions have taken the lives of more than three-quarters of a million Iraqis in the last seven and a half years. The Foreign Office acknowledged it helped Mr Galloway to make Mariam's transfer possible. We have not been used. We've made a humanitarian gesture which we think is right and which we will stand by. But the fact is that we stand also very strongly committed against the, the nature of Saddam Hussein's regime. We condemn that regime and we look forward to the day when that regime is changed in Iraq. Tonight, Mariam is staying at a hospital near London. She will be transferred to Glasgow for treatment, which will be paid for out of an appeal fund. Colin Baker, News at 10, Heathrow. There was no let-up today in our extraordinary late winter. Up to 12 inches of snow fell in some places and power lines were brought down. Elsewhere, there was rain and the threat of more floods. Tonight, there could be frost. Linda Kennedy reports. 
The water remains high and the flood alert is still in place. People in Whittlesea on the River Nen thought the worst was over, but the sandbags were out tonight. I'm going to stop awake and see how the water comes up and then I'm going to have to start putting the furniture on top of pallets and just put everything as high as I can. It's risen up, I would say, between two and three inches already and as you can see right at the very bottom of the garden, we are underwater there. In North Wales and Cheshire, heavy snow brought down power lines and cut off thousands of businesses and homes. On the hills, farmers fear newborn lambs have been lost. And it's not just rural areas affected. Big Ben could barely be seen through London's first heavy snowfall in mid-April for eight years. In Kent, there were some signs of spring, yet all the fun of winter. Although for drivers, the cold conditions have brought no joy. So far, parts of Scotland have escaped the floods and snow. But there was this tornado, filmed by an amateur cameraman. The Coast Guard called it a wind funnel, caused by strong winds and rain. But locals in Fraserburgh are hailing it as yet another freak of British weather. Linda Kennedy, News at 10. The chairman and chief executive of Vauxhall, Nick Riley, told his workforce today that he won't take any of his £160,000 salary this year. He wants them to sign up to a new pay and productivity deal, which he says is critical to Vauxhall's future in Britain. Reporting from Vauxhall's Luton Works, here's our business editor, Mark Webster. Despite the highly unusual gesture of sending this letter to each of Vauxhall's 10,000 employees here in this country, offering to take a pay cut, Mr Riley insists he's sincere and that unless Vauxhall's workers here at Luton and elsewhere make the same kind of mould-breaking agreement as their colleagues in Germany and Belgium, then the axe really could fall on plants like Luton. Reluctantly facing the media this evening, the man at the centre of this storm has given up his salary but could still live on bonus payments, which are almost as great. You know, I'll be living a little bit off savings, but it, it's for a year, and many people uh, don't have those savings even to, to turn to, so um, I'll be able to survive. Since Vauxhall workers are being asked to sign up to a deal which could mean pay settlements at or below inflation and further changes in work practices, it seems Mr Riley's offer has backfired. I could afford to give me wages above 150000 if I was getting that. I believe he's already a multi-millionaire, though. Won't make much difference to him, will he? Uh, just not good enough. Don't, don't, think it's, don't think it's a fair deal anyway. But this evening, as workers left the Luton plant, experts said the company had to face up to the wider problems of the European motor industry. Like all manufacturers, it's a victim of chronic overcapacity, some 20% in the, in the European market. Its other problem is that its model range at present is, hasn't quite hit the mark, uh, especially against its arch-rival Ford. There is inevitably a certain amount of brinkmanship about these negotiations. But provided a deal is reached within the coming weeks, Vauxhall says it is committed to continuing production of its models here in Great Britain. Mark Webster News at 10, Luton. Three Royal Fusiliers were reburied with full military honours in France today, more than 80 years after the Great War battle in which they died. Archaeologists found their bodies last year. Among those at the graveside today were the Duke of Kent, the Fusiliers' Colonel-in-Chief, and the 98-year-old who had fought alongside them at the Battle of Arras. Our Europe correspondent, Bill Neely, was there too. They were Fusiliers and they were young. Private Frank King, Private George Hamilton Anderson, and an unknown soldier. Their bodies unearthed last year by archaeologists, carried by today's Fusiliers with full military honours. Here too, a 98-year-old veteran who fought alongside the men in 1917. I said how lucky I am to have got out of the train because I was there in the same battle, you see, really. I just spent the next two years in the hospital with a mustard gas. But, uh, the, uh, you know, you, you, can't, uh, you can't imagine it really, you know. It was the Battle of Arras, a massive attack on the German lines. And when it was over, 100,000 men were dead. Private Frank King was 21, one of three brothers who died in the Great War. We entrust these three to your merciful keeping. 81 years on and their coffins were lowered gently. 81 years in which the families of Privates King and Anderson had no idea what had happened to them or where they died. We were just told that the two brothers died in the First War and that was it. There was, we, we didn't know anything else. 
It's a symbol for everybody else, really, all the other soldiers who died. And there's thousands and thousands of them, and it's really nice that we can lay at least one to rest. The last post, played for perhaps the first time for three soldiers who did not grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. There are a thousand British cemeteries like this on the Western Front, but there are 300,000 British soldiers of the Great War with no known grave. Today, three of those men were finally given a headstone and a name and a face. Bill Neely, News at 10 in northern France. We'll have more of today's top stories still ahead tonight, including the dust-up over Dyson. Are its rivals trying to bag more business? The man who makes lottery winners jealous, the businessman earning £140 million a year. And heading for danger, could old-fashioned leather footballs be causing pre-senile dementia? If you didn't head it, the ball properly and time it properly, it felt like heading a, a medicine ball, and you certainly felt it. The remarkable Mitsubishi Galant displays some surprisingly human characteristics. Passive rear wheel steering acts instinctively to keep a firm grip on the road. Whilst its climate control system stabilizes the temperature to within a fraction of the degree. And the revolutionary automatic gearbox actually learns your individual driving style and adapts to the road conditions. The new Mitsubishi Galant. Reinventing the wheel. There aren't many homes these days that don't need a mortgage. And because Cheltenham and Gloucester mortgages are available at all branches of C&G, Lloyds Bank and TSB, you'll find them on almost every high street. If you've got a high street, that is. Cheltenham and Gloucester, run to make you richer. So many people are telling us that Nice and Easy from Clairol is their favourite hair colour. Well, flattery like that is enough to make anybody go red. Or brunette. Or blonde. So if you'd like beautiful, natural-looking colour, why not find out for yourself how nice and easy it is to be natural? Hi, Spring's here. We've got even more products at low key season prices, especially in decorating. The colour coordinate range from Bimura. And the borders. You can mix and match them if you like. We've got crown colour emulsion, and these 10 colours are exclusive to B&Q. Rollers, heat guns, solid pine doors. And remember, if it's got this sign, you know it comes from a well-managed forest. Find any key season price product for less locally. We will refund double the difference. For your key season prices, you can do it when you be in q it. Buy a pair of glasses from Donald and Aitchison and get a pair of prescription sunglasses absolutely free. Perfect. A black hole is where a star's gravity is so powerful nothing can escape. It's the same principle with the new Hoover Tellius. Its sealed suction system has the filtration power you need to keep more than 99.9% .9 of dust particles locked in. Even particles as small as a grain of pollen. Rely on Hoover to do the homework. If you or your teenagers need a second phone line, you can get one half price with BT. Just call 0800 22 before June the 30th. Welcome back. It began as a dust-up. Tonight, it's beginning to look like war between two rival vacuum cleaner makers. The bagless and British Dyson make had been sweeping all before it. Then Miele from Germany disputed Dyson's advertising claims, and tonight Hoover piled in on Miele's side. 
Our consumer affairs correspondent Caroline Kerr reports. The Dyson bagless vacuum cleaner is such a success story in Britain, it's been chosen as a millennium product. But today its rivals fought back with a novel publicity stunt. Gentlemen, yeah. when you're ready. The German manufacturer's Miele publicly tested the revolutionary British Dyson against an old-fashioned German cylinder. Dyson said the test wasn't valid because they didn't use the right brush. Miele disagreed. Well, really, what we set out to prove here is to put the record straight. I mean, we want consumers to know the facts. And we want to reassure all those people who have bought vacuum cleaners with bags that they really have bags more suction than the bagless. The Dyson has no bag. It works by sucking up dirty air, spinning it round at a rate of about 900 miles per hour. And when eventually the plastic canister is full, you just empty it and wash it. The Miele, on the other hand, is a conventional cylinder cleaner. It comes complete with bags, which have to be replaced. Dyson only started to compete in the vacuum cleaner market in 1993. But last year they were the biggest sellers with 24% of the market share. Electrolux took 18%, Hoover 16%, while Miele only got 2%. The latest row has been sparked by a television advert, in which Dyson claimed theirs is the only cleaner to retain suction power as it fills up with dust. Miele say Dyson's test used the wrong sort of dust. Dyson say Miele are just jealous of their success. I think it's a case of a big German company trying to squash a small British inventor who happens to produce a radical new piece of technology that does the job better. The vacuum cleaner market is a multi-million pound business. No surprise then that this dirty little war between manufacturers looks set to run and run. Caroline Kerr, News at 10. P.W. Boerter, President of South Africa for 10 apartheid years, went on trial today for contempt of court. He'd ignored a subpoena to appear before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Botha, now 82, told reporters the court might destroy him, but it couldn't destroy his soul or his convictions. Hazo Africa correspondent Tim Ewart. The old South Africa drew up battle lines with the new here in the town of George today. One of the sternest and most stubborn defenders of apartheid was in the dock. He was once known as the Great Crocodile, Today, P.W. Bota took a last stand against those he perceives as his enemies. He chose to be tried for contempt rather than appear before Archbishop Desmond Tutu's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It stuck in his gullet to have appear before the commission at all. A black magistrate is hearing the case. He was told that the Truth Commission has documentary evidence that during his 11-year rule, Mr. Bota ordered the neutralization and elimination of enemies of the apartheid state. Protesters who gathered behind barbed wire at the court want him to receive the maximum two-year sentence. Mr. Bota remains defiant. They cannot destroy my soul and my convictions, he said. Mr. Bota has chosen confrontation rather than reconciliation. Both Archbishop Tutu and President Nelson Mandela appealed to him personally to back down. Now he's refused. The last thing they want is for him to be turned into an 82-year-old martyr for the right wing. Tim at News at 10 in the Western Cape. There was a health scare in Cambridge today when the midwife admitted she was HIV positive. The woman's been suspended from her job at Addenbrooke's Hospital. And a helpline's been set up to offer former patients blood tests and counselling. Medical authorities say there's little chance they've contracted the virus. Lord Neal's Standards Committee met for the first time today to discuss the funding of political parties. Bernie Eccleston's £1 million donation to the Labour Party led to the inquiry's launch last November. The Formula One boss said he's still considering whether to attend. And 4,000 people gathered at Anfield Stadium in Liverpool today to mark the ninth anniversary of the Hillsborough tragedy. A group representing victims' families promised to continue the campaign for a new public inquiry. It condemned last year's report as a whitewash. Relatives of people who have fallen victim to Kreuzfeldt Jakob disease are meeting tomorrow to talk about the health care and support available. Cases of the new form of CJD, the one linked to mad cow disease, are still few in number, about two dozen. But they're particularly poignant because the victims are invariably very young, struck down in their prime. For tonight's special report, our medical editor Lawrence McGinty saw how three families hit by this new health disaster are coping. Claire Tompkins was 21 when her boyfriend made this video. A vivacious young woman with a whole life before her. But this was her last holiday. Say hello, Spike. 
Just a year after these pictures, Claire, a long-time vegetarian, started developing the symptoms of CJD. Today, her father, Roger, looks through the diaries that chronicle her decline into the terrifying world of human BSE. She's doubly incontinent. Um, she cannot speak. Um, the doctors feel that she is clinically blind. Um, we, we like to think that she can see us and that she can hear us. So we talk to her, as I talk to you, very normally. Um, we, we go in there, we say hello, we talk to her and everything else. Roger told me four health workers help his family care for Claire at home. He makes up the feed she needs to stay alive, knowing that one day he'll face the terrible decision should they continue. If you like, we feel that there is a quality of life there, but um, yeah, the day I, I really do um, not look forward to it is the day we all sit around and think, is this now really um, the time? Um, and we don't know when that will be. Hello, Vicky. For Beryl Rimmer, that decision never came. Her granddaughter, Vicky, died of CJD last November after being in a coma for four and a half years. Beryl has nothing but praise for the nurses who tended to Vicky's every need in her last days and years. But now, Beryl told me she feels bitter that she wasn't given the support she needed in the emotional crisis of Vicky's illness. There was no help for, for myself. Just to know that there was someone there to turn to. Um, just felt terribly alone. No one understood what Vicky had. I think it was, it'd be different in another disease, but I think people were frightened. I spent the best part of the last week talking to the families of healthy, vigorous young people who've been suddenly devastated by CJD. They're all looking to the inquiry that meets in this room to do two things. Of course, to find out why this disaster was allowed to happen. But also, they want the inquiry to intervene now to ensure the best possible medical care for the victims of this terrible disease. Tomorrow at the CJD conference, this man will unveil the first guidelines for helping families facing the disease. The main messages I feel I'm trying to get across in conjunction with the CJD network is a fairly rapid response, fairly quick response, and also to be flexible. Flexibility is what Lorraine Robinson needs. On income support, she has to look after her grandson Josh because her daughter Stacy is in hospital with CJD. We're all very devastated. Um, we're trying to come to terms with it the best we can, but... <sighs> Coming to terms with tragedy is where society can help. Lawrence McGinty, News at 10. Families living with CJD. The legendary Celtic centre forward Billy McPhail appeared before a benefits tribunal in Glasgow today. He's claiming that he has brain damage because of the heavy old leather footballs he used to head in his playing days. The case was adjourned, but if Mr McPhail, who is now 70, wins the claim, others are expected to follow. Peter Staunton reports. For Billy McPhail, legendary goal scorer of the 50s, a fight to prove that football has permanently damaged his health. He's claiming compensation for losing his short-term memory and has medical evidence which he says proves it was caused by heading the heavy leather balls used at the time. He'll know in a month whether he's won a case which could affect dozens of retired players. The fence nose are always in the air heading the ball, but forwards are blinking while standing on the ground and there's, and there's a tremendous return of power, you know, into your blinking head when you hit a ball. The museum at Highbury chronicles the deeds of a generation who thought it natural to play with a ball which current players wouldn't dare to tackle. This is the ball they use today. It's lightweight and it's sealed so water can't get in. But this is what they used to use. Rain used to seep in through the seams. The longer a match went on, the heavier it got. Well, if you didn't head the ball properly and time it properly, it felt like heading a, a medicine ball and you certainly felt it. She's got a very bad bad memory problem and ongoing for the last 10 years and I'm convinced it was his football is done. And, and I'm surprised I'm not divorced. <laughs> Peter Staunton, News at 10. The numbers drawn in tonight's National Lottery were 1, 12, 18, 26, 29 and 36. The bonus number was 2. Camelot said three winners will share the jackpot.
The main headline tonight, the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement has been rejected by the Protestant Grand Order Lodge. And finally, meet Sandy Vile, who's just been identified as the world's highest earner last year. Mr. Vile, head of the American Finance House Travelers, picked up $230 million, or 140 million pounds. Serious money, as Lauren Taylor reports. This is financier Sanford Vile, who raked in more than 140 million pounds last year. His salary and cash stock options put him on roughly 390,000 pounds a day. On the list of the world's top earnings last year, Sanford Vile is head and shoulders above the rest. On the top of Britain's list is Jan Leshley, boss of Smithkline Beecham, who's thought to be on a package worth about 66 million a year. But other so-called fat cats, like Sir Desmond Pitcher, chairman of Northwest Water, earn to relatively paltry 310,000 pounds. Our top earners may be minor league compared with some of their American counterparts, but this ITV documentary on Britain's richest people, to be shown next week, suggests they certainly find ways of spending it. I spend at least four or five million pounds every year, minimum. Got to be. I know that it'll run out. I understand that. I'm willing to face the music. But I shall just go on spending until they tell me to stop. With top executives increasingly being offered stock options as part of their benefits and the biggest stock market boom the world has ever seen, the staggeringly rich can only get richer. Lauren Taylor, News at 10. That's the way the news looks tonight. We're back tomorrow. For me and from all my colleagues here at ITN, good night. Well, as we've seen, the bizarre weather goes on. Heavy snow, bright sunshine for others, cold temperatures everywhere. And tomorrow will be far from straightforward with a couple of low-pressure systems closing in on us. Go ahead to the weekend and there'll certainly be more showers around, but hopefully things warming up just a touch. Not tonight, though. The blue colours returning with a vengeance. The wintry showers are becoming more confined to exposed northern areas, especially the north of Scotland. But down to the southwest, the cloud gathering again with outbreaks of rain reaching Devon and Cornwall, turning to sleet over the moors. In between, though, clear skies and low temperatures. A widespread frost, as low as minus three in some places, with some icy stretches on untreated roads. So a chilly but bright start for many of us, some sunshine around. The cloud building up again, though, with a scattering of showers, especially down in the southwest with outbreaks of rain, turned to sleet or perhaps wet snow over places like the Cotswolds. That rain, sleet and snow will drift eastwards, roughly south of the Thames Valley. Further north, dry and brighter, a scattering of showers, but up in the far northeast of Scotland, outbreaks of rain and sleet becoming more prolonged. Cold everywhere again, at best 10, but quite windy. Here's a summary. Power Jam, generating electricity whatever the weather. Anchor cows are free range. That's why free range anchor butter is so pure and natural. Anchor, the free range butter.